we now have an evolutionary cosmology. After more than 2,000 years in Western thought of the universe being thought of as essentially eternal, or at least if created by God in the beginning, then going on indefinitely thereafter, uh, we now have the idea of the universe as an ev evolutionary system, starting with the Big Bang, um, and uh, the idea that it's been growing and evolving ever since. So the idea that it's governed by eternal laws doesn't really make sense, and I would suggest that instead of it all having a kind of Napoleonic code established at the outset, that if uh, there are laws of nature, then they've evolved just as the laws of the United States have evolved or the laws of England have evolved uh, over time. The, the way physicists tend to look at this now, is, according to some physicists I've spoken to, is that if you look at, say, the first billionth of a second after the Big Bang, mm -hmm. Uh, the laws that we now experience and the properties of the universe didn't exist at all. The universe was, it was structured quite differently and then even during the first second things changed quite rapidly. Well this is the effect of physics taking evolution seriously mm -hmm. and you see until 1966 physics held out against evolution which had become the dominant idea in the human sciences and the life sciences. Um, they still went on believing the universe was eternal um, they were the last people to take up this evolutionary idea. And we forget how recent this is. Most of our education, most of our thinking was shaped under the aspect of a much older and much mm -hmm. more classical paradigm. Yeah. So you seem to be suggesting that as the universe itself evolved from the Big Bang, it, it formed habits, it developed patterns which, uh, which have remained, but these patterns in themselves were somewhat arbitrary. It could have been otherwise. Yes, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't have been otherwise. And this is true of any evolutionary process, isn't it? I mean, the English language is an evolutionary system. It's evolved. We have words for things, like the word word itself. Well, other languages get on perfectly well using different words for the word word. Um, th th we could have used other words for words we now have. Um, they could have been otherwise. And we know from the evolution of other languages you can do these things in many different ways. Yet, for some reason, these particular words mm -hmm. became established and um, the evolution of our language has made some of them yeah. deeply habitual. Well, if, if we go back to the origins of the universe itself, to the Big Bang, which is, is sort of a good starting point, there's a sense in which all of this, all of this matter and energy and biological evolution evolved, in effect, out of nothing. Well, that's the theory, mm -hmm. you see, and I think really when we get back to the, these questions of the origin of the universe, we're dealing with the creation, uh, we're dealing really with the realm of creation myths, what in most cultures are called myths of creation, the stories of the origins of everything. In a scientific society, we have to have, as it were, a scientific creation myth. Um, of course, we don't know what happened at the beginning. We have to make it up in a sense and it has to be plausible and consistent with what we know. But the fact that theories come and go in the realm of cosmology with such alarming speed, now it, it's a ten-dimensional universe to start with in the primal field. In 1985 it was an eleven-dimensional one. There have been periods when it's had several hundred dimensions. These theories come and go. Um, and their attempts to conceive of the origins of things um, how the many arise from the one. And this is, of course, a very traditional theme in metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So what you're suggesting is that uh, just, I suppose, as a young child grows up and, and forms habits and learns language, so did the universe itself. Yes. I think if we think of the universe as an organism, um, and the idea of the Big Bang is very like those ancient myths of the cracking of the cosmic egg. Um, the, if we think of the universe as an organism developing from the original creative event, uh, growing just like organisms grow as trees and animals and plants grow as their embryos and then they get bigger and they form structures within mm. them. Um, the universe on the present model looks much more like a developing organism than it does like an eternal machine, mm. which was the primary metaphor of the mechanistic worldview. Mm. Uh, it's, it's barely recognizable. The old universe we were brought up with was an eternal machine that was gradually running out of steam heading towards a thermodynamic heat death. Well, we don't hear much about that anymore. The universe is now like this growing organism, which uh, has new things are constantly happening within it. 
And I think that the, just as an organism develops habits as it, develop, as it grows up, uh, this seems a more uh, plausible metaphor mm -hmm. for the universe than the idea of laws imposed yeah. from the outside. Well, we know that organisms develop habits. We know that we all have habits, and yet you seem to be asking us to look more carefully at our, our use of language, and, and not just to take things for granted like habits. Uh, you seem to be questioning the very notion, as far as I can tell, of time itself. Yes, um, and, uh, and I think that uh, the idea of habit, you see, when we generalize it, which other people have done before, C.S. Peirce, the American philosopher thought of the habits of nature a century ago. Yes. Samuel Butler, the English writer, thought about them. Um, when we generalize the idea of habit, um, we can see that something we know from our own experience may help us understand what's going on in the universe. Just as the idea of law, you, the traditional idea in science, is based primarily on a human experience, the experience of human laws mm -hmm. made up by kings uh, constitutional governments, emperors, and so on. But the notion of a habit, or even the notion of a law, but particularly the notion of a habit, implies that somehow the past is alive within us, even though moment by moment we, we experience ourselves always to be in the now moment. Hmm. We carry the past somehow. Exactly, and the past shapes and conditions the way we are in the now. The mm -hmm. very fact that you and I are speaking English is based on a whole process of learning of English and the language of speech has itself evolved and built up habits which mm -hmm. are greater than you or me. We inherit these linguistic habits. And, and you seem to be suggesting, if I can jump ahead a bit, that the conventional notions that we have, that, that the presence of the past within us is sort of locked into our nerve synapses or coded into various uh, molecules that are stored in the brain, that, that somehow that in itself is also an unproven uh, assumption that, that scientists hold and quite possibly an erroneous assumption. I think it is an erroneous assumption and the way that science thinks of the world right now is tr traditionally and conventionally is that uh, it's made up of material systems, energy, particles, matter and uh, the known fields of physics which are governed by eternal laws and what happens now depends on the way these material systems are right now memory traces in the brain, for example, as physical records of what's mm -hmm. happened. And that the universe is essentially amnesic. The entire f past is completely forgotten, in so except insofar as it's retained in some yeah. physical trace, like mm -hmm. a tape recording or mm -hmm. a written record or a trace in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it may be quite different from that. It may be that there's an inherent memory in the whole of nature, that memory is inherent in everything, and that as the universe grows and develops, these memories, through repetition, become increasingly habitual. Well, there is a sense in Oriental traditions that, that the past is alive, and I think even in modern physics, when we talk about the space-time matrix, there is a sense that, that all time, past, present, and future, can be viewed as, as part of one system and I existing in the present in, in some sense. Uh, this seems to be what you're getting at a little bit. Yes, although it makes a difference if you think that the past, present, and future are equally present, which is the conventional view of physics, mm -hmm. which has the laws as transcendent and in some sense independent of time. Or if you think what I'm suggesting is a fundamental asymmetry between the past, uh, the present, and the future, so that the past has an influence which is cumulative, which is different from the future. There's a real polarity in time on this view. In, in other words, perhaps the past is fixed, whereas the future, is, uh, there are many possible windows that can open up into different futures. In, to put it simply, yes. I mean, the past is, the, involves sort of actualities which can have causal influences through what I call morphic resonance mm -hmm. on the present, as well as through straightforward physical causes like motion, collisions, and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, but the future is not fixed in the same sense. Thank you.